Hey, I'm glad you guys are here. Welcome back to Wednesday nights here uh, at FBC this fall. Uh, as we said in Recharge just a little bit ago, we, we love this time, and it's, it's obvious our church loves uh, the school year here on Wednesday nights. It's just such a great opportunity for us, isn't it, to be able to eat dinner together, um, have things going on for our kids and our teenagers, and then for us to be able to gather together for these different studies and, and classes that we have. This is, uh, this is just one of the incredible things about being a church family and being part of the body of Christ is to get to do things like this, to do life together as we study God's Word. So I'm glad you guys are here tonight. Um, we are going to do uh, spend 13 weeks together. Uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you stay with me the whole time, if, if only half of you come back next week, I'll know that uh, I, I must have done something really wrong. But if you stay with me, uh, we're going to spend the next 13 weeks looking at the gospel. Okay, and you may say, well, why would we need to do that? Right? The gospel is the message that Jesus came, that he died for me, that I can place my faith in him to be saved uh, so that I can spend eternity with him. Like, I got it. I, I, can, I can articulate the basics of the gospel. Why would we need to spend 13 weeks digging in to the gospel? Well, I can tell you this. Um, we never move past the gospel as believers. We can spend every day for the rest of our lives until God takes us home as children of God, mining the riches of the gospel, understanding just the beauty of God's plan of salvation, what it means for our lives, what God is doing in the big narrative of scripture that is telling the story of the gospel. But then we can dive in, which is what we're going to do. And we're going to say, as we think about all of these words that we use to try to put language around such an unfathomable thing that God has done, that language that we put around it helps us start to understand, I believe, the character of God, to understand more of who he is, his nature, and his love for us, which in turn then helps us just develop an even more intimate relationship with him. We can apply the gospel to our lives and in that drawing closer to him. So that's my prayer as we set out on, on kind of this journey for the next several weeks is that with each of these, and you can see in your overview of the course there, the different uh, words that we're going to look at, these different ideas that each night as you come away, there are scriptures that you look at in a new way. Uh, that there are things about the character of God that you just fall in love with uh, in a fresh way, uh, that it just draws you to himself, um, that it draws you to his word. My prayer is that when we finish this class that you cannot wait to get into God's word yourself and see these, these truths and these things come to life. So I hope this just kind of sets you on a lifelong journey of understanding these things and thinking how they impact the way you live every day. So that's what I'm praying for as we get started. So with that, let's start with prayer and then we're going to jump in, okay? Father, tonight I, I thank you, um, God, that we can be here. I thank you for this church. I thank you for all the things that are going on on this campus right now. God, I thank you for our children, uh, how they are learning to praise you with songs that just lift up the name of Jesus. God, they're, they're in your word. They're learning truths that they can apply to their lives. God, they're, they're getting opportunities to just spend time with, with leaders that care about them. God, thank you for a church that loves children. God, I thank you for our teenagers who are meeting right now. God, to be able to worship, to hear your word applied to their lives. God, they are at such critical ages where they are making their faith their own and living it out. God, thank you for the leaders that are down there investing in them. Uh, who have the opportunity to help them understand and wrestle with the truth of who you are and who they are in you at a time when the world is trying to fill their heads with so many other things. So God, I pray for our students. I pray, God, that you would just draw them to yourself, God, that our students would be unleashed, that they would be lovers of Jesus uh, that follow him with everything that they have. So I pray for them tonight. God, I thank you for each of the adult classes that are meeting right now. God, as, as we dig into your word, as we look at different topics and explore it in different ways, God, I thank you uh, that your word has everything that we need for life. 
Uh, and God, even as we look at it tonight, God, would you teach us? God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would reveal the truth of your word to us as we examine it uh, for these next several weeks together. We love you. We praise you. Thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So you will see there in the table of contents, we're going to spend a couple of weeks right off the bat talking about the holiness of God. I do not think that we can truly understand the riches of the gospel to look at things like justification and atonement and grace and redemption and sanctification, all these other ones. I don't think we can rightly understand those without starting with the holiness of God. It is, it is crucial for us to build on that foundation. So we're going to take two weeks to really dig into it and explore this together. And then you can see where we're going to move from there looking at, at these different aspects of what it means for us uh, to be saved, what, what God is doing in the work of the gospel. So there's something I want you to see. There's a, there's a quote that we're going to kind of use as our starting point, and we're going to kind of dig into it, because I think it helps to summarize for us this idea of holiness, the way I want us to look at it for, for tonight, for our purposes. But before we go there, you've got the quote in your book, but first, I want, I want to ask you, when we say holy or holiness, what are we talking about? How, how would you define holiness? Or what are words we would use to define it? Sacred. Sacred? What else? Pure. Pure? What was that? Set apart. Set apart. Thank you. Without sin. Without sin. Good. Good, good, good. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Okay. So yes, I, all of these, all these words, sacred, set apart, sinless, pure, um, perfect. All of these things capture that idea of holiness. So with that in mind, um, look in your books on page two, or you can look up on the screen if you prefer, and you can have that for later in your book. This, what you have in front of you there, is a quote by an author, theologian, A.W. Tozer. Uh, he wrote a book called The Knowledge of the Holy. Uh, and this is, there's a lot of words in here. Uh, this is something to, you read it over and over again. You know, one pass through this, you may miss a lot of what he's saying. So we're going to kind of comb through this little by little. But let's just read it uh, to kind of get us, get us started for this evening. And he says this, holy is the way God is. To be holy, he does not conform to a standard. He is that standard. He is absolutely holy with infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of being other than it is. Because he is holy, all his attributes are holy. That is, whatever we think of as belonging to God must be thought of as holy. God is holy, and he made holiness the moral condition necessary to the health of his universe. Sin's temporary presence in the world only accents this. Whatever is holy is healthy. Evil is a moral sickness that must end ultimately in death. The formation of language itself suggests this. The English word holy, deriving from an Anglo-Saxon word, halig, or how, meaning well or whole. Since God's first concern for his universe is its moral health, that is, its holiness, listen to this, whatever is contrary to this is necessarily under his eternal displeasure. To preserve his creation, God must destroy whatever would destroy it. When he arises to put down iniquity and save the world from inseparable moral collapse, he's said to be angry. Every wrathful judgment in the history of the world has been a holy act of preservation. The holiness of God, the wrath of God, and the health of creation are inseparably united. God's wrath is his utter intolerance of whatever degrades and destroys it. He hates iniquity as a mother hates the polio that would take the life of her child. 
There is so much in, in this that helps us understand this idea of holiness. And in your book and up here on the screen, I've, I've got some of the phrases in red. So our, our guide tonight that we're going to work from is those phrases in red. We're going to pull those out of this passage that we just read. And we're going we're gonna to dig into them a little bit. And we're going to look at some scriptures that these truths are, are based in, that, that Tozer is writing about. He gets these ideas from Scripture. And so we're going to go to Scripture to understand what he's talking about, what, why he's talking about it this way, and then to begin to process it. So, so I wanted you to see the, the passage in its entirety, and then we're going to break it down into some sections, okay? So let's go ahead and go to that first bold statement in red that you have there, which says, to be holy he does not conform to a standard. He is that standard. So what are, we, what are we saying, or what is Tozer saying when he says that? To be holy, he doesn't conform to a standard. He is that standard. What is that saying about the person of God? It's a big room. I know it may be a little intimidating to, to speak. He gets to determine okay. Okay, so he is the one who determines, right? Yeah, he does not conform to a standard. He is the standard. So right and wrong, good and bad, are determined by him. He is that standard himself. He is holy. And so he, in and of himself, determines those things. Jason. right yeah so <coughs> excuse me battle and allergies here um so unchanging we're going to see that in just a minute we're going to look at some of these um some of his attributes and and see how those tie in and help us understand that god is you somebody said it a few minutes ago when i said to give me words um that help us understand the word holy and somebody said set apart correct who said that who said set apart? Yes, this is that idea. God is set apart. There is no one like him. He never changes, right? He is the standard. That is this idea of holiness that we see here. And scripture points to this. So here's what I want you to do for just a couple of minutes. We're, we've got a good group of people around most of the tables, except for, except for Paul here. You guys, I know. Um, but maybe join with another table. Here's what I want you to take a couple of minutes to do. I want you to read on this first page, on page four here, um, you've got three, you've got eight scriptures. Um, let's take them in two chunks. So let's start with the first chunk there that under that statement, the holiness of God refers to the absolute moral purity of God, the absolute moral distance between God and his human creatures. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to read at your table each of you look, look up a verse and read them out loud for your table. And for just a minute, I want you to discuss how these scriptures help us see that there is no one like God. There is no one even close to being like him. Uh, so take a minute around your tables, read those three scriptures and, and talk about them for a minute. And then we'll come back together. OK, do that right now.
you guys okay being a group of two? Is that or do you want to join with those guys? I hate to, you okay? You alright? Okay. I just I didn't want to leave you by yourself. <laughs> no problem. <coughs> All right. I hate to interrupt conversation, but I'm going to give you more time for it again. So if you had something really good to share, just hold on to it. And when I send you back to your tables to talk again in a minute, you can, you can start there and then jump into the new material. But, but share with me for just a minute or with, with all of us, um, maybe a couple of you, as you read these scriptures, thinking about just how God is so set apart, how he, his greatness, his majesty, all the things that were in these passages, what stood out to you? Anything, any of the discussion at your table, somebody want to share? What, what jumps out about him as you read these passages? Anybody? There's no other God like him. Okay. Yeah, he is, right? He is, yeah, there's, he, right. He doesn't just contain truth. He doesn't just tell the truth. He is the truth. Yes, he, the standard, just like, like this is saying here. He sets it. Yes. Anything else? He cannot be contained. He can't be contained. What else? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this, so what we're seeing in these, this, this, this aspect of holiness, right? When we hold holiness up and we, we look at it kind of like, like a diamond and how you would turn it and light hits it and you see different colors and different, you know, just different nuances of it as you look at it from different angles, right? As we look at holiness like that, we would say, okay, holiness, as we think about the holiness of God, and the fact that he is set apart, we, we see things like that, that he exists outside of time, that he cannot be contained. Um, 
that you know everything else that that we that we deal with right it's based off of something something else right like we like when we think about a lot of different things it, there's a standard we compare it to but for god there is no standard that he is compared to he is the standard so so all of these things are just helping us these scriptures these ideas as we think about them are helping us understand that aspect of the holiness of god that he is just set apart as guy said there is no one like our god and so it makes you, as you think about that, it makes you just step back and say, well, God's holiness, when we think about the holiness of God, and then we think about ourselves in comparison, what does it immediately do? Like, what do we see when we see the holy, when we think about the, uh, the set-apartness, if that's even a word, of God? What does that do when we think about ourselves? How unholy we are. Any other thoughts? That's a good way to say it. Anybody will say it any different? How dependent we are. Yeah, God is dependent upon no one. God needs no one. Right? He is the source of all things. But you and I... Right? We're the, we are not. We, we are in absolute dependence upon him for our very existence. And so as we see the holiness of God, it, it puts us in a healthy perspective. And when we, toward the end here tonight, I want us to, I want us to apply a little bit as we think about the holiness of God and we think about like, how that, how that truth and meditating on these truths of Scripture, how they should help us just interpret the world around us, the things that we deal with every day, the news that just, you know, floods into our phones and our TVs. And as we think about the world around us, like when we think about the holiness of God, how does that impact how we process and deal with everything else that we do in life? I want to get there before we close tonight, but just kind of put a pin in that for right now because I want us to come back to it. But right now, I want us to move on in this next set of um, scriptures that you have here. This next statement that the holiness, it is the central marker. It is the fundamental divide between God and sinful human creatures. And it shows us two things. First of all, what we said, right, our fallen condition, right? It, when we see the holiness of God, the first thing we understand is how absolutely sinful and fallen, hopeless, helpless we are because of who he is. But for us as believers, as followers of Jesus who have been redeemed, when we think about the holiness of God, it also ought to show us that anything in us now because of the Spirit of God that dwells in us, our redeemed nature, right? It is all because of His holiness. It has nothing to do with us, right? And we see our sinfulness, but then when we see our life walking with Christ, we have to be reminded that it is absolutely because of the holiness of God that there is anything in us that could even be described as holy right look I want you to think it's not on your on your tech on your sheet here but I want to read for you what first Peter says uh, in first Peter chapter chapter 1 um, starting in verse 14 he says as obedient children do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance so he's saying don't act like who you were before you came to Christ don't do it he says but in verse 15 as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it's written, you shall be holy for I am holy. What is Peter calling the believers to? To be set apart. To live differently from the world. To model the character of Christ. To live differently. Why is it possible that is Peter calling them to something that they cannot do? No, 
Is he calling them to do something that they are incapable of doing in and of themselves? Yes. But because he is addressing believers, he is calling them to something to, to live Christ like, to model and imitate Christ in the way they live. Why can they do that? Because they have been redeemed. Because they have been set apart, because they have been saved, because they have a new nature, because they have the Spirit of God indwelling them who empowers them and enables them to strive to live set apart, to live holy. So when we think about the holiness of God, yes, it should cause us to be humbled and recognize that there is nothing holy in us as we compare who we are to just His greatness and majesty. But then it also ought to cause us to just marvel that a God like that would make a way for us to be able to even have the ability to to strive to, to live lives that reflect and imitate Christ. That it's all because of what he has done. It is his doing. So I want you to go to your tables now thinking about what we just read and then read these scriptures. You may not get to all of them. That's okay. You can pick and choose between those five. But I want you to read those together and do the same thing that you did with the section before and just talk about how these scriptures help you understand this idea of our fallen condition in light of the holiness of God, but then our redeemed state in comparison, in relation to the holiness of God. So read together for just a few minutes. I'll give you about five minutes to do that, and then we'll come back together, okay? to sit and listen to me preach for an hour I would lose them like I didn't think I could keep them that long I thought this was okay yeah he's got to keep it moving yeah I had no idea what to expect I thought this one would be small I mean I really thought we might ought to move to a classroom but (laughs) it's funny the number of people that took it the first time they had the second time they may not even remember it well the balls are in here again they did it the first time Sadie she asked me at dinner, she goes, did I take that the first time? I said, Sadie, you didn't come to anything all eight weeks. You didn't show up anywhere for eight straight weeks. So no, you've not taken the whole thing. She goes, what are you talking about? I told her, she goes, I don't remember any of that. And Sally McGonagall goes, Sally, you were there. Or Sadie, you were there. She goes, well, I don't remember, so I guess I'll do it again. They loved it the first time. <laughs> if you want to jump in with me, you're welcome. So whatever you want to do. Yeah. Oh. There's another mic- there's handheld microphones up there if you want to. The next section will move to just uh, attributes of God, satiety, omnipresence, omniscience. Like, I mean, no, no, like the, the, after they, like the next section of the handout is moving on to looking at um, whatever the next phrase is that I've got. It's sure. like his attributes. Because God is holy, all his attributes are holy. Do you have a sec- another slide uh, for this part? Because the slides didn't move forward. Yeah, no, no. It was still just under this. Like, okay. I don't have another one yet. So, uh, I ran out of slide prep time with <coughs> Matt. These, these were good. Like, that's, that's a great time. Those quotes. That t- I, I did that last time. I just based the following that flow of Tozer's quote because it just it deals with everything you want to deal with, I think. So, yeah. Um, yeah, they need time to break it up and yeah. talk. Yeah. So the next section is just unpacking the, some of these attributes of God, just with some basic definitions and then some scriptures that, that highlight it. So. Um, at, at, some, at some point, I, I mean, they love it when, 
Oh yeah, I think it helps, but <clears throat> I absolutely think it does, but but I can also do this a bunch of times too, and it, <laughs> it keeps them. <laughs> I want to get uh, next week. I want to pull out the uh, the Piper, the Piper quote. Oh, I need to remember. I don't have it written down. I'd have to pull it out. But just that God cares more about His holiness, <laughs> and it's right for Him to care more about His holiness than anything else. Without, with just me see we've been doing this together for so many semesters now it just feels weird to be up here by myself it's more it's more fun to have somebody to to play off of here as we as, as we as we talk it's it's good all right <clears throat> so one or two tables dialogue with with us for just a minute as as you thought through uh, these passages of scripture, what stood out to you? What, what conversation came up around your table? That Romans 2, uh, verse, verse 4, right? That it is, it is God's kindness that, that leads us to repentance. That's good. Okay. One more comment? Different than us, his ways are not our ways, and like 
our learning curve may be a long learning curve, and, and uh, the reality is, is, is we will spend all of eternity uh, unfolding the magnificence of who he is and his grace towards us. And um, yeah, so just having a little piece to go, you know what, I don't have it all figured out just yet. Uh, I'm fine with understanding God knows a lot that I don't know, and I guess we'll, we'll keep moving in that direction. Yeah, so think about conversations maybe that you've had or that you've, you've overheard where someone will use that very thing, like I can't understand why God allows or why God did those kinds of statements, and people will use that as, a, as an obstacle, right? Well, I can't trust God because I can't understand what he's doing, but I love the way in the passage that you had here in Romans 11, Paul is worshiping God. He's praising God for that fact when he says, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways Paul is not bemoaning the fact that he can't understand it. He's rejoicing in the fact that our God is so set apart, that he is so holy, that he is so wise and all-knowing that we can't comprehend what he's doing, right? I mean, would we, should we, would, why would we want to worship a God that we could completely understand? Uh, I mean, when we make God... We try to make him so small, right? The holiness of God just makes us, like, make him <laughs> as bigger and bigger and bigger, right? I mean, that's, you know, we, we, get so, we get focused on the wrong things, I think, a lot of times. Yeah, I've heard a pastor <clears throat> say that if, uh, if your God is never challenging you and if his ways are not stretching you or if he's not, you know, blowing your mind with how awesome he is, then you're probably not worshiping the real God, right? You're probably just worshiping a version of your own God. Because the real God, I mean, he's, he's so high yeah. above us. Yeah. And, that's what and, and so what we're doing when we, when we don't do what Jason just said, right, we're, we're trying to make ourselves God, right? We're de-godding God. We're, we're taking him off the throne. We want to worship something we can understand, uh, and, but really what we're saying in that is, is we kind of want to be the standard, right? We want to be the one that sets it, right? The holiness of God forces us to confront that in our everyday lives. Remember we said the holiness of God has application in our everyday lives as well. I think this is one of those places where it really, the rubber meets the road, is it forces us every day to deal with, God, am I willing to submit to your plans and your ways and your desires Right? Or am I still trying to set my own course, chart my own path, um, and, and do my own thing? Right? This, this is one of those places it, it forces us to really um, get honest uh, with God. And when we understand how Scripture reveals Him to us, right, it, allow, it, it helps us be able to submit and say, God, there's no one like you. Where else could I go? So... Let's move on. We've got a next, another piece of the statement that I said we were going to go to the next red or bold statement is that because he is holy, all his attributes are holy. And so on this page, you've got just some of, I've given you five of the attributes of God that scripture brings out for us. There are many, many more that we could look at. But we've, I've just selected for you five here um, that help you understand the attributes of God. Some of these qualities, these characteristics of who he is. Um, so looking at these here, just let's, define, let's go through the list that you've got in your book in front of you here. Uh, aseity, that's a word that we don't use a lot. This may be one you're unfamiliar with, but this is just that idea that he is the source of all things. Uh, he's sufficient to himself. He's independent outside of anything, right? He is in need of nothing. Like this is that idea that God is self-sufficient. He's self-contained. He is, he is everything that he needs. Um, and scripture talks about this in multiple ways. So here in a minute around uh, your table, we're going we're gonna to look at those passages. Some of the others you may be a little more 
familiar with are the omni words, right? Omni, omniscient, he's all-knowing, omnipotent, he's all-powerful, omnipresent, that he fills the universe in all its parts. Some people define omnipresent is that God is, is everywhere, right? I think the better way to define it is what I've put here for you, that he fills the universe in all of its parts. And then the last one is immutable, that God never differs from himself. This is one Pastor Jason was talking about at the very beginning when we were talking about God's holiness and how do we, how do we, how do we define it? What are other words we can use? He says that he never, he never changes, right? He's constant, right? He, God never differs uh, from himself. So there are so many scriptures we could look to to help us understand this. So here's what I want to do. Um, we've got five here. I'll kind of do five sections uh, of the room. All right, so you four tables right here in the front to my left. You guys, all four of you, take a look at the scriptures on the aseity of God. Okay, that's the one I want you to read the passages, talk about them, uh, and then I'll let somebody from one of those tables share something about your conversation. For these four tables over here, um, we got, you, may, you know, you don't have to get together. Uh, you can talk them at your tables, but you guys focus on the omniscience of God. Um, you three tables right here that just run straight back in a line. You guys take omnipotent. This middle rectangle tables all the way back, omnipresent. And then this section all the way to my right, uh, immutable. So do the same thing we were doing earlier. Read the passages discuss them and we'll come back together i'll give you about five more minutes to do that okay how far are you trying to get today um oh thanks perfect yeah. oh thank you sir um i don't think we need to really spend as much time in these um This, I just kind of want to walk through like some of the, the narrative of Scripture and how it points uh, to the holiness of God, how these different aspects of like the laws, even the, the objects, some of the visions, the judgments um, are all, what are they helping us understand? The holiness of God and then responses to his holiness. Like I think we can talk through this without breaking them up into tables because we're not going to have them go to all these passages because we can only have we can only go to 745 oh thank you Rick Thanks, Rick. appreciate it very much um, and then and then this is the one I do want to this is that good landing spot about the character like the heart of God is to preserve his creation God must destroy whatever would destroy it and so what did he do you know he poured out his wrath on his son that's kind of how I want to bring this um, because in these two statements, right, how are the holiness of God, his wrath, and the health of his creation, how are they united? It was that like God does it in his son. Um, so so I, I do want to get here and just have a dialogue through, through, through that. So if we just kind of go quickly, just okay. summarize these without really digging into these. I yeah. can tell them they can go back later and read these passages if they want to. Okay. I wanted to poke at these a little bit. When I think of a saying, <laughs> my first thought so one, one of the I don't have time for too much of this but the uh, when, you, when you think through uh, the attributes of God in <coughs> two large categories the sovereignty of God mm-hmm. and then the personal aspects of God um, it, at times that's that's where the tension lies so even with the Savior you don't think the Savior is like uh, even the, the worship song he didn't want heaven without his soul so yeah, he brought great. heaven back right? and so right. God, God was lonely and so he made us those sort of things and so like Sadie <coughs> it's gonna you know are there aspects of scripture where where we would say that, that God allows himself to be vulnerable uh, from a personal standpoint, yes, Scripture paints that picture in terms of like a, a husband whose wife is cheating on him. Yeah. But, uh, this is an important thing to really balance out. That 
God is not lacking. Yeah, it, he, he allows it, but it's not ours. It's, it's not from a deficiency. Yeah. So that's the part yeah. I wanted to kind of hammer yeah. on those. I don't know that we can take that much time to do all of these, but that's what I was thinking in terms of. Okay. Like, so after, <coughs> we can get someone to kind of speak up, you can do that, and then I wanted to kind of address Get that one. That's good. Because I see it happen so often. Oh, yeah. I love that. Even that example of that worship song is a perfect way to... Well, it's actually, we rewrote it. Right? Yeah. We don't even sing it. Huh. Well, and I even heard a great... Uh, uh, what's his name? Um, one of the theology professors at Southwestern, uh, whatever his name is, um, Bingham, uh, Doctor Bingham, talks about it, and um, when he's like those those that language of God feeling things and you know having emotion, like that's for us, like the, the, in Scripture, that's for us because he's so set apart. <laughs> Right, he like it, it's to help us just be able to get our minds. Probably need to go. <clears throat> all right, all right. Let me bring us back together here, um, and we're gonna we're gonna give you guys a chance to share a little bit. So, section right here in the front about the saity, a saity. Somebody share. Uh, what what passage stood out to you? What did you learn? about this definition, this attribute of God. Any new thoughts? I am the great I am. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. There's no one like me. Amen. Amen. Exodus 3.14, right? If you couldn't hear, Sadie quoted uh, Exodus 3.14. I am who I am. There is is no one other. (coughs) Yeah, it's good. When you think of when you think about the saints, I wanted to pause here super quick. Um, uh, there are two large categories when you think about uh, God. Two large categories are the fact that God is is sovereign, and that God is also personal. And uh, it, it's very important to to know and to understand that at times those those two things can feel like they are intention. They are intention from our perspective. Uh, but we need to be very careful in the way that we speak about God, never undermining his aseity, the fact that he is self-sufficient. His fault, there's no deficiency in him. So let me give you an example. There was a, a popular worship song, I don't know, five years ago that said, uh, uh, you didn't want heaven without us. Okay? And this goes along the lines that, that says God was kind of lonely and uh, he... He made uh, a whole bunch of humans because he was lonely and he needed some friends. Um, And so whereas Scripture does speak of God's personal engagement with us, okay, and it even uses radical, pressing language where God describes himself as a husband whose wife is unfaithful. And the scripture in this is meant for you to engage in the personal feeling language, but you must also have great caution to know and understand that when the scripture speaks, that it is never out of a deficiency within God, right? He allows himself to be personal and vulnerable, but he is never a deficiency. Like, he was lonely, and he just wanted. uh, So you must be very careful to not uh, press upon his aseity, his self-sufficiency. He didn't need you, and he does not need you. It is out of his love that he created you, and he loves you. But it's not out of a need. Okay? Very important. We're only reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's not not a direct one-on-one through Jesus Christ. I'm not seeing the connection with what, what I just said. talking about the relationship between God and man. Uh-huh. He sent Christ so that we could be reconciled with him. 
because we can't be reconciled without Christ. I don't disagree with what you're saying. I don't know what, what that had to do with the saving, though. So we can chase that rabbit later. We yeah. do have to keep moving. We're up against it. All right. So this, these tables over here help me with uh, omniscience. What did you see? Anything new as you read those scriptures that stood out to you or reinforced anything? Okay. Yeah, our, our, our statement, if you couldn't hear, God is greater than our hearts. He knows everything. It takes away the statement to follow your heart. Instead, you should follow God, right? He knows. That's good. Anything else? All right, so let's move on back here. Omnipotent, our three tables. Okay. Yeah, is anything too hard for the Lord? And what does Scripture, how does it answer that question? No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's good. Middle section, omnipresent. When you read Psalm 139, what do you see there? You can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> you can run, but you can't hide. David, where can I go that you are not? Amen. Yeah, that's good. I love that. Yeah, there's a, there's a, uh, there's, there's both of those are at play there, right? That you can, run, you can run, but you can't hide. But then there's that idea, the comfort of, that that brings is God's got me um, because of his omnipresence. That's good. Last but not least, over here against the, the doorways, over here, these tables, immutable. What did you see in those scriptures? The Lord is uh, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father of life, there's no variation or shifting. All right. Yeah, so as you think about God's immutability, um, what do you think of the idea, common theology? You know, the God of the Old Testament was a God of wrath, and he was pretty hateful. I sure like the God of the New Testament because he's a God of love. What do you think of that theology? Not much. <laughs> Not much. Why? Based on an untruth. Yeah, this cer certainly, certainly it's untrue, uh, but... but God doesn't change. God wasn't like it, you got to roll up your sleeves and figure things that figure these things out in terms of the progressive revelation of Scripture, knowing that the, the same God that wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah is the same God who sent His Son. Like you, you got to figure all these things out. But but you can't come up with a conclusion of like, well, God just changed. Well, it's, it's mankind doing what He always does, putting mankind's limitations. Amen. All right. Well, so for sake of time, we're going to jump on. So flip the page there in your book. And I want us to consider this next statement. God is holy and he made holiness the moral condition necessary to the health of his universe. There's a lot of things we could talk about here, but where I want your mind to go for tonight is understanding, right? We talk about this often here uh, at, at church and sermons, Bible studies, is that there is a, there's an, an arc, a narrative 
arc of Scripture. It all points to Jesus, right? We've talked about that multiple times. We, and it's so true, but in that arc, narrative arc of Scripture, we see the holiness of God as kind of the, the thing that holds that up, right? We see it throughout Scripture, wanting us to understand the holiness of God, His purity set apart, all of those things that we've been examining tonight. And so what you've got here on these, these next couple of pages are just some of the ways that Scripture helps us see that. First of all, through the commands of the Old Testament, thinking about the moral law and the spiritual law and the ceremonial law, all those chapters when you're doing a Bible reading plan uh, and you get, you get to Exodus and Leviticus and we, we get to some of that and you just kind of want to get through it because there's so many like, you know, rules and feasts and, you know, you got to do this and you got to wear this and you got to do this this way. And it's, it's so much information and you kind of want to breeze through those and get on. Um, but there's so much there that we are meant to understand in the law. What is God showing Israel um, about themselves and about himself? That he is holy and they are not, and that there is a standard that God has, that He is because of His holiness, that, and He gives it, and He shows them, He describes it, He tries to put some framework around it through the law, but what they come away with is understanding it is something that they cannot keep, right? The law, the purpose of the law, to show them the holiness of God and their utter unholiness. They cannot keep the law. And then, and again, it's reinforced through the tabernacle and through the temple. Think about the furnishings in those structures. What, what, what do you remember about how the temple and the tabernacle were to be built? What were some of the materials that were supposed to be used? Gold, like precious, precious stones, wood that was not common. Um, Cedars, yeah, I mean, you got linen, uh, you know, uh, colorful linens that were used, the big, all these things that were, that were, that made it just set, set apart. No other structure looked like that, right? Their homes did not look like, it was not common objects used to make the temple. These were special things. And so even as they would approach these places to offer sacrifices and to worship God, they were being reminded of just how set apart God was. Visions that we see all through the Old Testament. You've got a list of them there. Moses at the burning bush, Moses on Mount Sinai. What, what stands out to you about, about those? Those are fairly common uh, stories that we read in Scripture. When Moses approaches the burning bush, holy ground, when Moses comes down off of Mount Sinai, what was the people's reaction? Well, yeah, there were, yeah, but <laughs> his face was shining, right? They were like, don't, don't look at us. Go away. Cover that, right? We, we cannot be in, in the presence of, of God. Um, you know, you're, you're radiating the, the holiness of God here. And so there was fear that came upon them. I love this passage in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And it talks about how his, the train of his robe filled the temple. Uh, and what is Isaiah's response when he sees like the fire and the, the doorpost shaking and God and just his glory? What does Isaiah say? Yeah, woe is me. I'm an unclean man. Um, and so all of these visions, just sh as people just get a glimpse of who God is, right? They're, 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 they're just getting a, a taste of like this holiness, this set apart, this all-powerful, all-knowing God. We see that in Scripture, the judgments of God. Um, time and time again, when God is, is pouring out judgment, even on His own people, why is he doing that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's, if you couldn't, if you couldn't hear it, right? He's coming against the sin, the sin that would destroy them, right? God is, God is coming against that. 
Um, that's good. And so there's multiple ones of those that we see here. But as we think about God's judgment as a holy God against sin, like we see the examples of that that you've got listed for you in the Old Testament, we can think of examples of how God is, is doing that, pouring out his wrath against sin. But what is the ultimate expression of the wrath of a holy God toward sin when he's pouring out his judgment? Yeah, go ahead. Juan, you know this. What is the ultimate expression of the wrath of God drawn from Jesus on the cross? The crucifixion of the Son. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah, and so to kind of land the plane for the evening, I want us to, to stay here with that thought for a moment. <clears throat> to preserve his creation, God must destroy whatever would destroy it. And then the final statement there was that the holiness of God, the wrath of God, and the health of creation are inseparably united. Thinking about how the ultimate expression <clears throat> excuse me, of the wrath of God was poured out on his son on the cross. Right? Like we don't pause to think about that and think, and think about the holiness of God as being one of the things we're supposed to understand in that, but, but, but we should. We absolutely should come back to understanding why was that necessary? Why was something so, so gruesome, so, so cruel, so, so torturous, so, so painful? Why, why was that necessary? So when I, when I think through, <clears throat> that there's, there's an incredible scene in the Gospels when Peter, for the first time in Caesarea Philippi, declares, uh, you know, you are the Christ, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, you're right, the Holy Spirit showed that to you. And then what's the very next thing that occurs? Jesus tells, begins to tell them for the first time, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be killed and resurrected. What does Peter do? rebukes Jesus, right? The one that he just declares the Messiah. And you pause and you think, why? It's, it's, it's because the, even those that were, it is a perfect example because, wait a second, Jesus, we're, we're walking with you, I follow you, all those things. Like, like you don't need, you don't need to, to die for me, you don't need to be crucified for my sin, right? I'm, I'm right here, I'm following you. No, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand the holiness of God. You don't understand there's nothing without the cross. Even for the disciples that are following Jesus, what they need, the only salvation that there is, is through the cross. Every one of us underestimates the holiness of God. Every one of us is just like Peter and is like, you don't really need to do that to save me. I'm not that bad. That was Peter. We're not that bad. Can't you just overthrow the Romans and I'll sit next to you? And they're always arguing about, do I get this seat? Do I get that seat? They have no clue, right? Because everyone underestimates the holiness of God. We are all just like Peter. You don't need to do that for me. Yeah. And, and in that same vein of thinking, right, when we underestimate the the holiness of God what we're doing is also underestimating the destructiveness of sin it becomes really easy for us to excuse sin and say it's not that big a deal right the holiness of God demanded that he punish 
sin. God could not just look the other way with sin. If he did, he would not be holy. He, sin must be dealt with. It must be atoned for, a word we'll look at later. But in doing that, we absolutely, like the holiness of God, and when we think of that in relation to the fact that he poured out his wrath on his son, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says that for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, right? What, what, hallelujah, what an incredible thing for us to understand that God God was doing, right? But it's all rooted in the fact that he is holy, right? He is the only one righteous. The only way for us to be made righteous is if the righteous one took our sin upon himself and paid for it. So that tells us that we should never minimize the the destructiveness of sin in our everyday lives. The more we meditate on the holiness of God, it ought to show us the heart of God to want to deal with the sin in our lives because he knows how costly it is, how destructive it is to us. And so we should never just try to hide it under a rug, but we should be quick to confess it, quick to deal with it. Why? Because God is holy. And because that holy God has made us a new creation in Christ and he has clothed us in his righteousness. And because he's done that and he's put his spirit within us, he has now called us like we saw in in 1 Peter, be holy as I am holy. This is that idea that is at the foundation of everything else that we're going to look at tonight when when we think, or the rest of the time we're together, when we think about God's mercy and his grace redemption, reconciliation, the atonement to just marvel that a holy God, that all these scriptures we read tonight that just talk about, words can't even begin to describe His magnificence. But that kind of God that words can't describe is the God that chose to show grace and mercy and to atone and to have a plan from before the foundation of the world to reconcile us to himself. Uh, It speaks to his character. It speaks to his love. Um, And so I want you this week, the challenge to you is just to go back and meditate on some of these scriptures. Maybe allow God to show you ways in your life that you minimize the holiness of God uh, and ways that maybe you could disciplines you could put in your life to just make sure that is something that is in the forefront of your mind to just honor and revere him and worship him as for who he is hopefully tonight's helped you see that and lift your gaze a little bit so thank you for being here tonight we're out of time um we ho- hope to see you back next week hope this didn't scare you off we're going to look a little bit more next week at the holiness of god bring your book back, bring your book back. we will give you new pages to add to this, so uh, by the end of the semester, you'll have, a whole, you'll have a whole workbook here that you can refer to, okay? God bless you guys. Have a great night. Thanks for being here, night one. Good stuff. We did it. We did it. Theology's fun. <laughs> Hello. Okay. My name's Joe Pickle. Oh, hey, Joe. I look at there's not, you know, God knows everything. Mm-hmm. You know, we, there's no way we're, you know, we just don't measure up to him. Right. Now, he reveals a lot of things to us. So we do know quite a bit, but we don't know everything. Right. Why did he do that? I, okay. <laughs> In my mind, it's because he wants to have a relationship with us. He wants us to come to him. He is our heavenly father. He wants us to depend on him. The things that I don't reveal to you, you come to me and I'll take care of you. But you have to be willing to come to him. Sure. That's the way I look at it. That's good. That's the way I kind of look at it. So I don't sit there and 
contemplate, well, I, I, I knew all this, you know, how can I, you know, how, well, I'm not going to believe in this because I don't know it.